Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Brain Club. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns. I'm the executive director here at All Brains Belong. I'm really glad that you've joined us. Let me share our share screen and we'll get oriented. How are there still open tabs on my browser? I don't know. Here we go. So we're really excited uh, to be revisiting our Everything is Connected to Everything, Improving the Healthcare of Autistic and ADHD Adults project today. Um, and specifically, we're going to be looking at the real life impact um, in small ways on um, the healthcare system outside of All Brains Belong. Uh, we uh, are asynchronously joined by a panel of primary care physicians um, who practice in the mainstream healthcare system, uh, who um, are sharing their experiences with learning about um, the Everything's Connected to Everything project and um, some reflections on the healthcare system and the patterns facing uh, their experience of the patterns that we talk about at Brain Club all the time. Of course, Brain Club is our weekly community education program about um, neurodiversity and related topics of inclusion. Um, though we are uh, going to be talking about health related topics. Um, today is for education purposes only. This is an education space uh, bringing people together based on a shared vision of what's possible in uh, um, attempting shifting change by uh, systems change by shifting social norms. Um, and uh, as I said, um, uh, this is for education purposes only, not for medical or mental health advice. I know that gets kind of, when we talk about health topics, it gets a little nebulous sometimes, but though All Brains Belong has programs that, uh, that, that uh, engage with some of these other functions and features, this one is for education purposes only. All forms of participation are okay here at Brain Club. You can have your video on or off, and even if it's on. We do not expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to sit still or look at the camera or like any of those other neuronormative constructs. So please feel free to um, walk, move, fidget, stim, eat, you know, whatever, whatever needs doing. And you're welcome to communicate however you are most comfortable. There will be um, a portion of tonight, 25 minutes of a pre-recorded set of interviews um, during that time, you're welcome to use the chat box, which is completely optional since the main idea is up on the screen. Um, but uh, then we'll have plenty of time for discussion and you can communicate however you are most comfortable at that time. You're also welcome to send private messages uh, to me or to the ABB team. In addition to affirming all aspects of identity, you know, I think especially when topics like healthcare, are these like heavy topics that really a lot of people carry a lot of a lot of trauma, a lot of distress related to healthcare experience. Just really, um, uh, just it, it, as part of queuing safety to all people, um, just ask that you discuss the impact of your experiences, not the events themselves, not the specifics when, when discussing something that's distressing to you. And um, of course, we're balancing uh, individual versus group needs. Um, speaking of access needs, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the closed captioning live transcript link, but if not, look for the more dot, 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 and choose show subtitles. And that's my visual support to actually open the chat box. I missed all kinds of messages already. Hello, everybody. All right, now it's open. Um, and speaking of the chat, um, as I said before, the chat is optional. And for many brains, the chat is an important way of being able to communicate without using mouth words. Um, and you don't have to think about it or wait for your turn. You can kind of just, you have a thought, you get it out. And at the same time, there are many brains for whom the chat is really overstimulating. So we just, um, just giving you permission to do what needs doing, including to completely ignore the chat if that's what you need. All right, so we're kicking off a new theme today. Um, every month we have a new theme. So March 2024 is all about systems change, systems change from the ground up. The idea of, um, you know, top down systems change, you know, policies and like big, you know, um, that, that's one way to change systems. But we have found here that bringing people together 
um, and just doing it differently. Parallel play with the systems. That's another way for systems change. And that's what we'll be talking about in different, different uh, applications of, of, of which throughout the month. Because what we know is that the status quo of so many systems does not work for all brains. And we know that neurodivergent people are more likely to struggle to access critical resources like healthcare, like school, like employment, like social connection. We know that one size fits all does not work for all. Um, and as we set out two years ago, um, as we said uh, to do anything for the neurodivergent community, we have to do everything. And that's why our programs are not just direct services in terms of providing medical care, social connection opportunities, teaching people to develop an understanding of their needs, um, training employers uh, to understand how to work with people with all types of brains, directly supporting the employment of the people in our village. We're doing, trying to do all of it because all of it we think is part of health. And we have been so grateful these past two years to be co-creating this, you know, all brains belong experience with, with, with you as the people in our village and really bringing people together and, you know, reimagining what's possible. Um, which is why I am so excited to announce that just a few hours ago, um, ABB released our first ever impact report. Um, and uh, if, if, if any of our team can put that URL in the chat, that would be amazing. Allbrainsbelong.org forward slash impact if anybody wants to check it out. And there's um, the idea is, is uh, it's, it's stories, stories from including for many of you, stories of your experiences with our programs. Um, and uh, we're really excited to share it with you. All right. So what are we talking about? Everything's connected to everything. Um, what we find here at Allbrains Belong in our medical practice is that the overwhelming majority of our autistic and ADHD adult patients have a constellation or a grouping of intertwined medical conditions involving multiple systems of the body. And what we find is that because the healthcare system is so broken and um, imposes a lot of barriers to clinicians being able to address multiple problems at a time, um, often, um, there's this fragmentation in treating these intertwined problems separately, even though they're not separate. And in fact, sometimes the standard way we take care of some of these parts of this constellation actually make the other parts worse. And so um, this summer, uh, with support from the Organization on Autism Research and HRSA's ARP grant, um, we released this free resource that we call the All the Things Project which has resources for patients and resources for primary care clinicians to identify and work through these patterns together. Um, it was an attempt to bridge what's called the double empathy problem. You know, I think doctors and patients, clinicians and patients don't often speak each other's language. And given, again, how broken the healthcare system is, um, you throw in all of the systemic barriers to um, anyone getting their needs met, patients and clinicians, and I think everybody's thwarted and nobody wins, and um, often there's this mismatch of communication that really does interfere with patients getting what they need. So uh, this was a set of tools um, to try to bridge those gaps. And so what tonight's program is about is that um, we interviewed um, three primary care physicians from the traditional healthcare system who practice in usual typical settings um, who have uh, been using this guide and we learn what their experience has been. Um, often um, we know that, um, as I said, clinicians and patients don't often speak each other's language. And one of the parts of the tool is to like directly bridge that gap. This is part of the tool that a patient can print out, hand their primary care clinician, and it introduces the project in a way that clinicians are used to, like language that, that they're used to reading about and hearing about, and then they can access the resources and explore them. And that's what happened. And so now we have these three people now talking about what that's been like for them in their practice. So um, we're going to play a pre-recorded conversation. Very excited and grateful to our panelists, Dr. Laura Bujol, Dr. Laura Black, and Dr. Tim Leshnack. Before David starts playing the recording, 
Um, I wanted to just name a term that I, um, I, I kind of dropped a few slides ago, but the double empathy problem that I think is really important. We talk a lot about at Burn Club. The idea that um, when there is a mismatch between worldview and communication style, this is where breakdowns, communication breakdowns take place. So the term double empathy problem was coined by Dr. Damian Milton, who's an autistic social scientist in the UK. And he found through multiple research studies, and it's been reproduced time after time after time, is that there's not one normal type of communication or social skill. It's about a it's 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 about a mismatch where that communication breakdown happens. So um, I would like us to be listening for um, uh, a different perspective. And maybe, maybe, and we'll have plenty of time to discuss um, if there's anything surprising or new, other perspectives that, that you're hearing. Um, I would just mention a word about language. You know, here it all brings belong. Um, we, you, you tend to hear, I mean, not, not everyone, because of course we're, you know, we're not all the same. So we might use different language to describe our own identities from time to time. Some people might use identity first language. For example, I am autistic and ADHD, that's part of my identity. So I use identity first language. Um, uh, uh, you will hear some language that you don't typically hear at Brain Club. Um, you will hear um, language reflective of the medical paradigm. So I wanna just like prepare you for that. It is what it is. Here we go. All right, so David, take it away. Hold on one second. I'm having just a little bit of a technical difficulty here. No worries. Take your time. I, I think, you know, one of the things that's going to be that, that, that is so powerful about this project and both, you know, your role as a reviewer and your role now is it's it's I think it's about application in a traditional practice like I can go out there and be like I have a practice with autistic and ADHD people and this is the medical problems they have but it's like all right well that's nice I don't have that practice I think it's important to learn from how is this resource actually you know like playing out in like the regular world like in the traditional healthcare system um, yes. uh, because because that's where the mass impact is that's where most of the patients are I'm curious was this a pattern that you were already seeing in your patients? I think there was somewhat of a pattern maybe, but I think I notice it more now. So when we first connected about this constellation of, of medical conditions, do, I, I kind of remembered you like be like, yeah, you know, I kind of sit, sit anyway. So like, was that a pattern that, that you think you had you know, seen? In hindsight, there's, a, so there's some people that come to mind. There's some patients that come to mind and I'm like, oh my God, could that be for them too? Um, and I, I don't know if I could immediately connect it to you know, all the things and it, it, this, per, this this patient of mine, are they autistic too versus is, you know, does it explain why they're not getting better on certain treatments? And I think pain was a big thing. Pain is a, is a big barrier to patients that I see, whether it's treatment of obesity, diabetes, or, um, just making any change to their lifestyle, but I'm in too much pain to do that. Was was this pattern, was this something you were already seeing? I, I'd have to say personally, yes. Um, uh, I, I think all of us in, in medicine and in primary care, we we, we tend to attract a, a certain audience at times and, and, and perhaps in how I go about things, um, my, my audience, uh, uh, has a, a certain number of folks for, for which there are a lot of interconnected and intertwined uh, challenges. And, and so I was already, you know, have been working with these patients for, for many years now uh, and, and learning from them, uh, working with them and learning from them. And so this, uh, 
the, the presentation certainly validated uh, everything that I've and, and, and my patients have been experiencing. There's just so many people who don't know about this. You know, we have, you know, we have patients who they, they've been struggling for decades. Um, and the, and the pattern wasn't matched. And, you know, I, I, and, and I blame the healthcare system for that because of the, you know, thwarting, thwarting clinicians from being able to take in all this, you know, and anything, take in anything new. Yeah. What do you think of that? I mean, I, you know, what I tell the residents, is like, sometimes you will feel like you're kind of in a checkbox world and, and we need to remember to look outside of the checkbox world and look at the person sitting in front of you and get them what they need. How do I get the care people need when it's so obvious and it's like low hanging fruit, but insurance won't cover it or insurance covers it and it's not available. It's, it's like, if you wanna help somebody, how about we start with the chronic conditions or prevention of the chronic conditions or prevention of the exacerbators of the chronic conditions, but instead we're focused on the treatments. And you have to be this sick to get this treatment, but it makes no sense to wait until you get that sick. The system, right? The system thwarts everybody. The healthcare system is so complex, even the people in it have trouble understanding it. So, so like you're seeing this and you're recognizing that everything's connected. Um, and yet, a lot of these patients, they've seen lots of clinicians. Um, yep. What do you think um, gets in the way of professionals not making those connections? Um, I, I think it's the dynamic between the provider and the patient. So the few patients that come to mind, I think there's something behavioral or mood related. And unfortunately, I think the patient is angry. What I've experienced as a, as a barrier is a patient is angry and frustrated and fed up because they've been either objectively, obviously discriminated against, told off, told that they're not being taken seriously, um, or, and so they develop this defense layer. So, and that I think in some cases can also be some of the pathology, like I think fibromyalgia is another good example as a comorbid condition here. And then there's this overlap of some uh, psychiatric diagnoses too, severe depression, bipolar disorder, um, trauma. So I think that's been really hard because then it's hard to get in and really connect with a person. So, um, Behavioral dynamic, interpersonal dynamic, I think sometimes they're perceived as moody or dramatic, unfortunately. And a lot of these patients are women, not all. And this is where I would love to learn from you because I don't think I fully understand and maybe I don't see the same population fully represented as you do too. Um, some people are in hiding, some people do not come to the doctor, um, but usually they're angry, frustrated, discriminated against that up. The system is so broken. Why don't people get faxes? I have no idea. But, you know, little things like that, because to be honest, I feel like it may, I think it goes back to what you're saying, just like all the things you have to keep track of, and then you're not feeling well, and then you have to go back and forth, and then you have to go through the phone tree, and I don't like the phone trees. It's just, it doesn't work. And A lot of patients who have this constellation of intertwined conditions, they have a lot of, um, you know, negative healthcare experiences. They feel that they have been invalidated, dismissed, that people didn't, you know, they didn't get it, they didn't hear them. Um, you know, do, do you, what do you, what do you think of that? I, I, I you know, that's been a, a, a journey of discovery for myself in, in that, I, I think as a as a physician, we we hold ourselves to I need to have the answer, and and if I don't have the answer, that's going to be unacceptable to the patient. And and working with these folks, they, they that's not their expectation. They just want someone that will listen to them and work with them. And I think about neurodivergent nervous systems, and you know, all neurodivergent folks are. A, very heterogeneous group, of course, but 
when I think about um, like even sensory processing, like the sensory systems um, that are either taking in more information than other people or less information than other people, an energy system, I think um, the, the neuroception system, the threat detection system, there are a lot of people who are extra sensitive to threat. And it's like acquired trauma physiology, um, that hypervigilance, that like looking. So, so, so if I'm someone who has hypersensitive neuroception and I enter a healthcare encounter, there's going to be something that someone's going to say or do that is I'm more likely to experience as threat because of these cues from the environment, my lived experience, the, 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 the vibe. I think that underscores the importance of, of how we communicate and, and, you know, you just look at the words on a page and you could communicate those in so many different ways, whereas the content's the same, but, but the way it's conveyed and the way it's received is so, so different. And, and, and we, you know, I, I, I not only, you know, I'm seeing patients, but I get to work in a training environment and, and spend a lot of time talking to our doctors that are training in family medicine of the importance of how they communicate and, and how they convey those messages. So you're embedded in, in that individual's care and they're going to partner with you. And, and that, yes, those tests were, you know, we use the term negative a, a lot, you know, the test came back negative. And, but yet that doesn't mean that there's not a something going on. It's just that we haven't found it or, or, or that the test won't show it. Uh, and, and, you know, trying to kind of communicate that is, is so, so important, uh, especially when dealing with uh, questions to which we don't have answers just yet. I think that, you know, energetically and cognitively like that openness like that constant like that the metacognitive aspects of medical practice where you're like thinking about how you're thinking and learning and moving through the world and like oh yeah there's this like there's this thing that now i'm being presented with and it wasn't like part of my thing um but i'm open to new things coming into it not not everybody can do that right metacognition and this like cognitive flexibility piece is a higher order brain function. And the system thwarts everybody, like the healthcare system. Like it doesn't just, just it doesn't just thwart patients, it thwarts us, like it thwarts clinicians. We're just like treading water, trying to survive a lot of the time. We don't actually often have access to those higher level functions. And then there's the time barrier. Um, the very patients I'm thinking about I ask for extra time and it goes so fast and it's not enough. And I even go over and it's still not enough. You know, you're, you're bringing up the barriers that happen, um, like the barriers to access while they're there. So yeah. the, you know, the, 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 but, but there's so many barriers that even prevent them from getting there. Yeah. So you must pick up the phone to become an, to, to become a new, you know, to make an appointment, you yeah. the executive functioning of like all the, all, all those pieces too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you mentioned trauma, you know, all these people with healthcare trauma, it's like, well, I made the appointment, but I'm going to cancel it last minute because like my limbic system tells me that it's not safe to come back to this place. The, the patients I do know who have a diagnosis of an autistic disorder or of some sort or something else going on with a neurodivergent diagnosis. Um, because I think that's relevant to what we're talking about here for people who aren't diagnosed or people who don't have the diagnosis. Um, but I can think of a few people who probably either avoid care or even are discharged because of no shows and things like that. And it's terrible. It shouldn't be. I think systemic ableism is like so embedded in medical training and, and in practice, all the people that when they don't come to appointments, it's like, oh, well, they know show, they don't care, they're not engaged in their health care. But it's like, okay, whoa, um, it's maybe because of their disability that they don't know they have. You don't know they have, and they don't know they have. The system is created a certain way. If you don't like it, then you can look for another job. Um, I do know I have friends at other places that I won't name that are, yeah, as you described, they, they right, don't, you don't have time to think they, it almost seems they don't really want you to. You just need to do these things this many times a day and move on to the next thing. And um, you're a cog. No, I, yeah. And but those docs aren't 
you can see them uh, not being happy. That's not what we went to school for. These patients describe that in all of their years of failed healthcare interactions, um, they felt that they were not believed. And so they come in and they have the stories of, you know, they were invalidated and dismissed and shut down. They were told, go lose weight. They were this, they were that, like just all of that. But these patients, especially these late identified neurodivergent adults, they have been invalidated and dismissed and shamed by so many people in their lives. And so they come in and doctor says, um, you know, well, your tests are normal. <laughs> and now it's this trauma response, which I think is a unique barrier to healthcare access and engagement that, I don't know, I don't, I certainly didn't get taught that in medical school. What do people say that when they, um, you know, af af after they've like seen that the, the, the map is like bigger than even the patterns, it, you can't unsee it. Um, so are you, has anything shifted at all about, you know, you'd seen it already, but now, now that it's like, oh, this is a, this is a thing, has, has that, has that impacted what, you know, anything? You know, interesting in, in some of the, the in, short answer is yes. <laughs> the, the long answer is, is acknowledging, you know, how things are, are, are interwoven. It's, it's taking a look at, at our interventions, you know, whether that's a, a, a prescription, a supplement, a modality that we're using and, and recognizing not only the potential for good, for benefit, but, but also having to be cautious about, you know, can this be harmful? Um, like the relative contraindications, like I didn't realize that in this particular subpopulation, these things that are evidence-based practice, you know, like propranolol for POTS or something, I didn't realize that in this population, that is going to make this person worse. Yeah. Yes. And well, that's like muscle relaxers. I remember reading about muscle relaxers. I was like, I mean, reading it, it makes so much sense, but I have to admit, I've reflected a lot on who I've prescribed muscle relaxers to and who should or should not get them. Yes. And it's really hard. Like, you know, we trained in an era where it's like, well, you know, don't, don't prescribe opioids. And it's like, well, what do you do? You like muscle relaxing. It's like, what, I, it, but, and, and without like necessarily even recognizing like, what is pain really to actually think about, you know, for some people, pain is their joints going out of alignment. It's mechanical. Yes. Um, for some people, it's like they're cutting off their blood flow um, or like, you know, people who, um, you know, on, on surface appear to, you know, be healthy, but they really have like really bad small fiber neuropathy, um, you know, just like all, all these things that I don't know, I, they weren't on my radar. They weren't on my radar until I experienced them personally. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, this is what's going on for a lot of people. So muscle yes. relaxant, you know, you just made them worse. Yes. Yes. I, yes. Cause I think, um, you know, I think, I think a lot of our treatments serve, you know, again, we have this huge spectrum of human and it kind of serves this middle and, and, you know, if you are in a system, which I am not, where you need to see someone every 15 minutes. You don't have time to think about all those other people on both sides. And that's, I think, where people don't get better or they don't trust their doctor because they're not listening. But I'm not giving excuses to doctors, but when you're in a system that sees someone every 15 minutes, you know, it's it's just a challenge. I did go through the guide. I haven't gone through it recently, but I found a lot of the things in the guide were things that aren't um, I complicated as what they're not complicated. And I think that's kind of what blew my mind. So I don't know if you've, you know, uh, looked at the, you know, the, the, the clinician resource guide, and if there's anything in there that, you know, if, if, if you've used it, um, it's totally fine. If not, but if you used it, I'd love to hear about that. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, uh, so answer, I guess, uh, uh, yes to all of those questions, uh, have, have looked through it and you know, using it as a reference when I'm, when I'm meeting with a, a patient and, and that's in the back of my mind, uh, going through things that we're discussing as far as symptoms they may be experiencing or signs they, they may exhibit. 
and 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 that sense of okay what you know what what have we what have we done what have we tried what else could we recommend uh more recently it was working with someone who is in uh you know experiences a lot of chronic pain as a result of hypermobility and exploring low dose naltrexone since um talking to you like especially like things like hypermobility eds how do we manage that. Um, I've reached out to our children's hospital, physical therapy, our adult, and luckily our physical therapy office right next to our office does, will take adolescents and help with um, joint stabilizing. And they gave me the name of the person who specializes in that. So it, it's been very helpful. Looking at, at some of the medications that we've been using or, or even supplements, and and trying to fine tune those for minimizing the side effects and, and you know maximizing the beneficial effects, um, and that's been a it, it, an ongoing navigation process. I love that you said that. You know, like back back in the day when we first started working on this, the the idea of turning this pattern and stuff we were seeing into like a usable resource, it was really first and foremost about the latter it was the idea of wow there are some standard medical interventions you know medicines supplements that 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 actually make some of these other parts of the constellation worse and <laughs> holy cow i don't i don't know like i didn't know that i don't know if people know this like so it was really about identifying those relative um harms to within the constellation and, and I think, you know, relative is a very good choice of word. I, you know, I often have this discussion with folks that, that we're, we're always looking at, at what are the risks and benefits of these interventions. And, and when, when there's the thought that the risk may be minimal, that doesn't mean zero, uh, but that the potential benefit may be greater, you know, I, I push that into the reasonable status. And 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 it, and, it, and and again, getting back to the trying things, it's working and saying, okay, you know, let's let's try this. We'll we'll talk again next week, and then we'll we'll find out if it was helpful or harmful or somewhere in between, and and then and then let's 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 look on the other part. So it's it's very much a team effort, and uh, and and now it's becoming increasingly a community effort when there are you know additional resources for uh, all of us to you know share share victories and 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 suggestions and uh uh again kind of try things with that ultimate goal of 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 improving the situation you now that you have this framework like you're a systems thinking pattern matcher like that's how your brain works so like now you have this new this it's not new but you know like you have this thing that now you're matching like as you go through yes. the world like even I have like this now, the um, hypermobility chart. Yeah. So, um, so I, I'm still learning, but I feel like I've I've come a long way since we've talked and hopefully I'll keep going. Yeah, it's, we, we, we certainly have to acknowledge that we don't have all the answers, but uh, but we wanna work collaboratively on on, you know, addressing things that we're able to address. Absolutely. Anything I didn't ask you about that you want to mention? Oh, I, 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 I'm, you know, we've covered a lot of grounds. <laughs> I, I just, you know, again, kind of reiterate that, that, that partnership that's so important um, with patients and, and the navigating the journey together. Uh, we, we learn from our patients, you know, a lot of the, 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 um, tools and techniques that I might be applying to folks, I, I'm, I'm getting them from others and, and, uh, and, and looking uh, and, and listening and, and saying, okay, um, yes, uh, you, were, you were on a, uh, a support group and, and, and this was the topic of conversation. Well, let's, uh, let's look at this um, you know, a little bit more scientifically and, and, and let's explore this treatment and find out if it might be a, a safe and effective um, modality that we can use and, and you know a lot of times the answer is yes and we we, we decide to go forward and, and 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 try something along those lines but you know in the absence of those those groups and those forums uh, uh we, we may not be moving forward 
I love that you said that because I didn't tell you this part, but so brain club. So this, this, this program, this, uh, this, this, um, interviews with, with, uh, three or four, um, primary care physicians, um, talking about this project. This is part of, um, where, where this is going to go. We have a, a weekly community education program called brain club and every month has a big overarching theme and then there's subtopics each week. So the theme for March is systems change from the ground up. And what you just said is exactly why this topic is, is in March Brain Club. It's next week's Brain Club. Um, because it's the idea like we, we learned this from our patients. This really is this village here of learning and healing together. Um, and it just so happens that there was evidence to support each piece of what the people brought us mm -hmm. um but we wouldn't have been looking for it if they didn't bring it and so really just co-creating you know we had you know more than 100 people in focus groups sharing what worked and what didn't work and that's how we learned about the relative i don't want relative contraindications relative harms or like things that um side effects we didn't know about you know anything else you'd like to say or share or um how do you talk to someone about all the things and how do you i guess how do you even say that uh, it's so foreign to me how do you kind of open up that door with a person with a patient it's like this self-selected group of people whose needs were not met by the traditional healthcare system they mm -hmm. are um you know so it's it's and it's certainly not a homogenous group of people by any means but amongst that group whose needs were not met they were more likely to be autistic and or ADHD, and they were more likely to have this, this constellation. So, so a new patient comes in and like, I've done um, on my like new patient intake forms. Um, I, I screen for all the things for all my new patients and I'll send you what I use. Um, it's very, it's very much like a simplified version of, 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 of what we have up on our, all the things project website. But, um, so I'll say, you know, I noticed that you had X, Y, Z, A, B, C. Did you know? Um, that there's actually a grouping or a cluster of intertwined medical conditions. Um, and I usually, you know, whether they're, you know, if they're in person, I'm like, you know, turning my laptop with their virtual, I'm sure, screen, and I show them a visual support. I think visual supports to sort of like anchor what you're talking about. I think, I think most brains benefit from visual supports, whether or not they are like dependent on visual supports or not. To oh, process agree. Something totally. Is different, right? yeah. yeah. So, so the visual support and the visual support I use, which is the one that's in the, all the things guide is that, I don't know if you've seen like the rainbow braid yeah, that you has all that. the different systems. Yeah. So oh. the majority of patients who, who, who come to all brains belong, they struggle with a grouping of medical conditions that involve something in the connective tissue bucket, something in the GI bucket, something in the sleep bucket, something in the, you know, pain bucket. And, and, and like, you see them, they're like the mouth drops and their eyes are wide. And you're like, you know, and I'm like, oh, do you, do you, do you think that applies to you? Like, I don't know. Like, they're like, that's me. Like, like a, like a thousand percent of the time. That's what they say. And I say, well, you know, I think the healthcare system often interferes with clinicians having the opportunity to address multiple problems at the same time. But really what happens is that when we fragment out these different parts of this cluster, um, we miss the fact that there's like internal conflicting needs where some standard parts of this cluster make the other parts worse. Um, and so like zooming way out, we turns out that if we approach this through a, like a lens of a big picture, mm -hmm. um, we find the things that make your thing better without making the other parts of your cluster worse. Like in my, in my practice, we do a lot of group medical appointments. We do a lot of like group learning and a lot of like visual supports and education and stuff. But I, I, I think like in a, in a, in a traditional practice, um, you know, I might just like send them to the, all the things site, you know, Hey, you know. Okay. Check this out and next time we can talk more about it and let me know if any of this resonates with you because there's all those patient tools on that site. Thanks. Yeah, that's simple enough. I like it. One of the things I think we still struggle with is that patients, I think, have often internalized the healthcare system narrative of like, well, what's this? You know, what's the, what, what, what's my hypermobility contributing versus like, what's my fibromyalgia or like, what's my mast cell dysfunction or what's my, it's like, whoa, what would it look like to zoom out and say, like, we don't have to fragment your body parts. Um, we could support your neuroimmune health in this way. Do you have any thoughts on that? 
Well, it's I, I think that that goes along the line of the the specialization in many ways. And uh, okay, you've got this body part, so you see this person. You've got that body part, and you see that person. And 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 those people aren't always talking to each other, even though your body is. You know? Anything that you and the patients that you work with would like to give to doctors like me who don't who are probably needing to learn more about you know what is there anything universally helpful that we can do to break down a barrier and invite change Well, that is there anything that you would like doctors to know about how we can break down barriers and invite change? Anyone have anything that you'd like to share? Do you ever have like doctors come and shadow you, doctors from other practices? I feel like someone, people should come and spend the day at All Brains Belong and just watch how you interact with your patients. Oh, thank you for saying that. Um, we've had some folks, we've had some folks be involved in various ways and um, along those lines. Um, I think, I think some folks are interested in like the logistics of like, you know, how do we do group appointments or like, how do we do this or that? Or how do we address this topic? Like those, those kinds of things. Um, yeah. And we've, you know, we've had medical students, um, which has been really cool. Um, really cool. The idea of like upstream, upstream to really be introducing people to, to this stuff that's so common. That certainly wasn't part of my medical education at all. I love this comment. I love this comment in the chat um, um, about separating physical and mental health. You know, I completely agree. That's, a, that's, that's so harmful to make that distinction. Tracy says, I'd like doctors to know that neurodivergent people are processing 40 to 60% more sensory input. Yeah. Thank you, Tracy. What else do folks, um, what would you like folks in the traditional system to know? Go for it, Sarah. So, um, one of the things I've been, we've been in, a couple of us have been sort of involved in this um this this research project about sort of healthcare narratives, and and a lot of what you know and so we we end up sort of looking at the stories that of people's experiences with the healthcare system, and which is kind of so in in so many ways so validating because it's like so parallels my own experience. And, and oftentimes it parallels my own experience, but but what um that yeah, the, what Jenny's just saying right now is the the not the not disbelieving you. Um that that piece seems to come up again and again. And I think what what strikes me that I would like and what I think I'm reading other people and who would would also like is 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 that I have something going on. I don't know what it is. I want to understand. I want to understand what's going on with my with my body. And I'd like us to not stop till we get to the bottom of it. And and it, a test might come back and say that you, I don't have X, I don't meet the criteria for X, Y, Z for condition X. But but I'd like people to not stop the inquiry there. I'd sort of like my physician to be a partner at helping me to understand and get to the bottom of what's going on in my body and get me to the places that I could fig that would help me to figure that out. And that that would be our job that we would finally on that we would find that the end of the, the, the thing would be like, you know, and, and it might be like that it's, like what I have is what I have is stress, and then they could understand how how my stress is creating this can this thing that's happening, and and then why I need to deal with my stress. Or it might be, 
It might be that somehow they, my my mental health is is impacting what's going on, but may, but then they could help me connect how this thing is happening in my mental health is creating these physical things that I'm actually experiencing. So then I could know why I need to address my mental health in order for my physical stuff to get better. But but to help me connect the dots because they have the experience of I have the like I'm the expert that. I don't feel better and you telling me that it doesn't register on a test that doesn't help me. But I, you know, so, so I'm the expert on when I actually have enough information to feel like this makes sense to me and I can work with that theory. You're the expert on the, the, that you have the background knowledge to help me connect the dots. Once we both have enough information for the dots to be connected. So th I guess that's what I'd kind of like is, is, for you to listen to me as to whether I, whether I I'm feeling like this makes sense to me I can work with that theory and until it until it makes sense to me and I can work with that theory we're not done and you're the expert on like the the ways that how, how the dots could be connected to make sense so anyway I'll stop there amen to all of that and I think Sarah, um, you know, I just really want to just reinforce how how on point this is. Like, I am the expert, not just in my in my body, but I'm the expert in whether I've had enough information. Like, what a what a really poignant thing to say. Yeah, um, I I would also say that um, while I think. And I think we heard this from some of the panelists around like there's some things we don't know about or there's some things we don't have enough information about. Like, actually, there's a lot of things that we do have information about. It's just that it's not coming from the sources that maybe we were expecting it to come from. It's like coming from the patients like like that's that's where the information is. Right. So that I think is. um you know, a, 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 a paradigm shift, also including the idea that there are some medical conditions that have like tests that are pretty, they're pretty sensitive. Um, and when they're, they turn up, um, you know, they show something and then we can feel pretty good about that. That means something. Um, when we're talking about neuroimmune conditions, we're also talking about things that don't have good tests. And, and that's, that's important too. And so um, to Sarah's point about, you know, um, uh, we don't, we don't keep, we don't, you know, we don't give up, we keep, keep searching. It may also be that we have a way of understanding this um, based, based on the information that a patient has provided and um, what, what helps them get better um, as opposed to this paradigm of, I will necessarily have a particular test to, you know, name something. And sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. I'm going to read a couple of uh, comments from the chat. Um, so Christina says, asking the patient what they think is going on before they share what the doctor thinks is going on. I mean, I remember as a, I remember being taught to do that as a first year medical student. And I think the healthcare system, you know, for all the reasons you heard described, and you've heard us talk about at Brain Club before about how the system towards clinicians and patients, right? So, you know, some of these, 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 these basics and perspective taking, um, it's none of us can perspective take when we're being, you know, tortured by the system. And Shelly's comment, um, being the captain of the ship, being a partner, partner in your care. My therapist always says, I'd love if medical providers didn't sigh when they see my little notebook of questions. I know this is a product of the larger issues in the system and lack of time, but trusting me as a patient to know how to prioritize and end still respect their time, amen, or set me up for a second follow-up if needed, if you run out of time, right? It's, it's transparency. So yeah, unfortunately the system has made it such that we only have whatever, 15 minutes together um, and we've run out of time. And I still want that time to be used in the way that uh, works for you. And so just as, you know, I, I, I think, I'm, you know, we've talked about this at past brain clubs, just the idea of, you know, when, when, when patients organize their thinking in writing and provide and make themselves a visual support, there is nothing wrong with that. 
And if there is the sigh, if you're picking that up, that vibe, it's so palpable sometimes. Um, conflicting access needs. Gail shares, um, uh, it's almost like mainstream docs are more invested in what's not wrong. I'm going to comment. I'm going to read your quote, then I'm going to comment. What's not wrong, instead of trying to figure out what is going on, doctors need to go to a room with a blank slate, assuming they don't know who the person is, they need to find out. Yeah, and, and remembering that the structure of so many of medical tests in 2024 are very much, there. That's, that's how they work, as opposed to like... Um, uh, I forget what they called it in Star Trek when you're like, you know, you just get the report on like, you know, this is what's going on with someone. It's 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 more about this test is looking for this thing. And if this test is not turning it up, um, it's not that thing. So like the whole clinical reasoning based on testing is what you just said. So, yeah. Sierra sharing each person brings expertise to the conversation, right? And I think Sarah said that too, right? So I'm the expert in me, you're the expert in the medical conditions we're discussing, you come together and we are, we're, we're a team. Tracy says it would be nice to have a, 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 a tra training about neurodiversity. Yeah, we think so too. Um, I, Heater says, uh, I, I can't imagine being a clinician that rolled their eyes when a patient wants to be involved in their care, questions, medical notebooks. I love when my patients do that. Help me help you. I tell all my patients this. This is a team sport. We're working together. Oh, amen to that. Patients are so lucky to have you. Right. I mean, why would we not want people to be able to communicate in the way that works best for them, that they are best able to share their truth? Why would we not want that? Uh, Ginger says, it's less about what I'd like doctors to know and more about what I would like them to do to get active in policy change, changing our current dysfunctional siloed medical system. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think Ginger, that's that, that I, I'm glad you said that, right? Because that's, that's what this conversation is about, right? So there's policy change top down. And if people are like treading water and they feel like they're drowning, the idea of like, well, when would I have free time to advocate for policy change? I'm just like, I didn't even get to, I didn't pee all day. I didn't eat. I didn't drink water. I didn't pee all day. Like what now what? Right. So, so there's that. And so this is the idea of, of systems change from the ground up of just like doing it differently because it can be different. And someone needs to advocate top down as well. Sierra says, reframing away from a diagnosis of exclusion to a positive diagnosis. Negative test is often what we expect in so many of these conditions, right? And, and it all brings belong. So Sierra and I and Gabe, we're always like, we're naming that. We're like, we're going to order these tests, but we expect them to not show anything because they're not good tests. That doesn't mean that we're not dealing with all the things. Jenny says, what you get taught to do in medical school was a fantasy. It was impossible to carry out. You were forced to cut corners constantly. Yeah. Peter says, there's so much in the system that benefits from medical provider, benefits from medical providers being rushed. Most of it's run as a purely money generating enterprise. We're all begin to wanting to, we all begin wanting to listen and hold hearts tenderly. Yeah. Lover. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we I think we heard that. Right. We heard that um, in, in one of the panelists comments about like the the systems that where where clinicians feel like cogs. It's just like we don't even really want you to think. We just want you to do the thing. Systems perpetuate systems. That's what systems do. We might have time for one or two additional comments if anyone has anything to, to share. David says, the most common complaint I see in support groups is when a provider doesn't know what's wrong. They feel like they have to give a diagnosis. Then they pathologize and say it's anxiety. Yeah, I, David, I, 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 I want to connect that to something Sarah said. You know, this idea that we are making a distinct a distinction between physical health and mental health is, is so bogus. It's the nervous system. It goes through the whole body. 
So it's not like, oh, well, you manage your mental health and, you know, then, then, then your symptoms will go better. It's like, we have to manage the nervous system, like the big picture, um, the, you know, your nervous system is reacting to the environment. Sarah, I like that. So Sarah says, so theoretically, good systems could perpetuate good systems. I like to think so. Sierra says, I think providers are often not comfortable giving a diagnosis that there's no quote, cure for or treatment algorithms. Right. Because in 2024, it's how a lot of a, 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 a lot of um, the system trains you to evidence-based medicine. And that means you follow this algorithm. Um, and, and I think, I think that, um, that that was one of the reasons that we designed the all the things guide as it was. I mean, not that, not that there's an algorithm, but that like, yeah, it's a, it's a set of guidelines. Every single, every single line in that guide has research to support it. There's things we do here that help a lot of people that we didn't put in the guide because it wasn't like um, clear enough. It wasn't clear enough to be relevant and appealing to the mainstream population. I mean, so every single thing in that guide. And so I think that's why, I think that's why it's working. I think it's because it's, it's, it's really about, it's like we started the beginning of the hour with the double empathy problem. Um, it's about it's about how we communicate, um, and when the system is thwarting both sides, um, we're definitely not likely to be able to perspective date in either direction. Um, yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Lizzie. Awesome. Um, Sarah, I just I, one one last thing was just I think the what the what um one of the doctors said about um that it wasn't nearly as important for the doctors to have an answer as it was for them to have an ally. I mean, I and I think that's uh, that just seems to come up again and again, especially if you've seen ten doctors who don't have answers. You don't expect your doctor to have an answer right away. It, you, you, that's not the important thing. You know that you're dealing with something really difficult. What you want is to, is to have an ally who will help you get to the bottom of things. So, so it, one of the things that would be really helpful for doctors to know is just that, for especially for people who are, um, who who have have seen a lot of doctors or who are having a hard time getting to the bottom of things, that we don't care if you have an answer. We just care. We care that you're with us trying to figure it out. Like at the end of the day, doesn't everyone just want to know that they are understood by another human being? So with that, thank you all so much for being part of this really important conversation. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. So next week, uh, we're continuing um, our theme of systems change from the ground up. Um, uh, we, our presenter is Dr. Winnie Luby from our board of directors. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a conversation um, between Winnie and I talking about authentic systems change. What does it really mean to, um, what does systems change from the ground up really mean in terms of um, involving and co-creating an experience with the people you serve? So uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Have a good week, everybody. Bye.